This video is brought to you by KEH, the re-commerce camera company. Not only is KEH the oldest and biggest at what they do, buying and selling exclusively used camera gear of all sorts since 1979, but they do it well with integrity and both a 180-day warranty and 21-day return policy, free shipping on transactions over 49 bucks. Which is why, because they make it as futz-free a process as possible, they are our go-to whenever we are looking to fund new purchases by selling our own gear or buying that special used piece of kit properly graded and checked when we want to go quirky or old school. Check them out by clicking on the links in the description below and get 5% off when you buy using the discount code HUSHOP, a 5% bonus when you sell using the discount code HUBONUS. Thank you, KEH, for making this episode of Budget Gourmet possible. Oh yeah, you know you want one. There's something extraordinary about engaging an actual advanced lever, focusing manually, tripping that soft, very quiet mechanical shutter, or just running your eyes and fingers across one of the most cohesive industrial designs of all time, the of-a-piece build quality of a 35mm Leica M. Like this one, actually. A single-stroke M3 lent to us by our friends at KEH in bargain condition, which is to say fully functional, though it could definitely use some cosmetic work. But hey, that's what makes it a bargain. But if a Leica Film M is a bridge too far for you financially, we're talking thousands of dollars, pounds or euros, tens of thousands of renminbi, hundreds of thousands of yen or rupees for the body alone. A camera first released in 1954. Well, I think if one is open to a bit of lateral thinking, there is another way to experience all of these qualities to varying degrees, to be fair, at a fraction of the price. In fact, a far more economical way of entering, and then if you really enjoy it, building a working 35mm film camera and lens collection. Although, if you go down that path, you really should invest in the entire film workflow, including darkroom, but that's another episode for another time. In this instance, I'm talking about thinking era, mid-20th century, rather than the form or brand of camera. I'm thinking, in particular, of a couple of wonderful Canon SLR 35mm film cameras I own. I bet you didn't see that one coming. Like this uh, 1960s era FTQL. Or this 1970s era F1 either of which have much more in common with this 1960 M3 than they do with a 2021 R5, for example, right down to the surprisingly similar yet so very different ways one opens an M3 or FTQL to load or unload film, which in the case of the M is practically a Japanese tea ceremony in and of itself, even if the camera was made in Germany. But maybe you're thinking to yourself right about now, no way, or... Really, Hugh? A Canon SLR? Not a Canon rangefinder like the Hansa of 1937 or 7S of 67? I understand. But if you can, hold that thought, and let's get into it. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. And today's creative whack on the side of the head for our series entitled Budget Gourmet is why not a vintage Canon SLR instead of a Leica M film camera or the more obvious Canon rangefinders? But in order to answer that question, we have to ask ourselves why a 35mm Leica M in the first place? Because, hey, if you really want a Leica and you know precisely why only a Leica will do, why only, alternatively, only a rangefinder will do, I understand. Although, if you are absolutely positively certain of this, candidly, your time will be better spent doing something other than watching this video, like saving up for that Leica. I understand this, too. Still, you might want to hang around for a bit as I attempt to deconstruct what makes that Leica, or more generally, 35mm film cameras, so attractive. 
I've already enumerated a number of qualities inherent to this mid-20th century wonder of mechanical engineering and design. To this, we might add other qualities, like heritage, inspiration, a prompt to plumb the depths of one's memory to a simpler, more joyous time, if you are of a certain vintage yourself, or perhaps if you are of a more recent vintage, a pathway to feeling for the very first time today what it's like to experience the luxury of time, perhaps the freedom from the ubiquitous whirring and beeping and grinding sounds that are endemic to every waking moment of modern life. Maybe an appreciation for the actual human beings who designed, manufactured, and assembled these cameras. Or the absence of fear every time you look through a high-resolution, high-refresh-rate, high-dynamic-range EVF that you are slowly killing off bits and pieces of your retina. Maybe, you think, a Leica M is a worthy investment. I understand all of this, too. And I would agree with you. But I want to tell you that you can achieve most of these ambitions, get that same feeling from these particular canons, the same heft and mechanical precision, more or less, the same joy from silky smooth manual focus with hard stops and dedicated aperture rings, along with the sense of accomplishment one obtains by mastering their use. And of course, the utter absence of whirring and beeping and grinding, oh my. There are distinct advantages to the Canons too, beginning of course with price, whereas a Beater M3 can set you back 1500 bucks or more. You may be able to pick up a Canon F1 in excellent condition for less than $400 with a Canon 51.8, maybe a 1.4. The F1, for those of you who don't know, was the absolute flagship of the entire Canon line when it was introduced in 1971 to take on Nikon's mighty F2. The F1 was also the body that introduced the new FD mount, which would eventually number 135 lenses from Canon alone. Or even closer to an M from a design, manufacturing, materials, and capability perspective, a Canon FTQL with an FL 51.8 for less than a hundred bucks. This was Canon's take on the Nikomat that Nikon had introduced a year earlier in 1965. We are talking about order of magnitude differences in price compared to a Leica M. Then there is the fact that an F1 or an FTQL, the QL stands for quick load, is much faster and simpler to load even after you become familiar and comfortable with the M3's procedure. Perhaps most importantly to my way of thinking, parallax who? As in, any SLR allows for much more precise framing, composition, and focus than an M because unlike the Rangefinder M, the premise of a single lens reflex is the what you see is what you get light path. When you look through an SLR viewfinder, you are looking in real time through the lens. There is no need to adjust for parallax as one must when using a rangefinder. In that system, you are not looking through the lens at all, but through an entirely separate optical path, a viewfinder mounted above and to the left of the lens. Because you are looking through the lens on an SLR, you also don't have to worry about focus calibration the way you do with a rangefinder, which also means that you can preview the depth of field, that is, see exactly what will be in and out of focus. And again, this is simply not possible with a rangefinder. Well, like it did make a VisaFlex reflex housing, but then one wouldn't be using the rangefinder anymore. And that particular type of VisaFlex is about the most Rube Goldberg-esque creation I've ever seen in all of cameradom. Think zone focus is the answer? Think again. Not only are there times when you will want or need to shoot wide open with razor-thin depth of field, and the old mantra of F8, set it and forget it, will not suffice, but, oh, by the way, engraved symmetrical depth of field scales on lenses notwithstanding, Depth of field is asymmetrical from the plane of focus. It's actually shallower in front of the subject than it is behind the subject. 
With the F1, you have the additional advantage of interchangeable viewfinders, including, among others, a sports finder and a waist level finder, neither of which is possible with a Leica M. And with either of these Canons or any other SLR, you don't need an optional finder to shoot wider than 28 or longer than 90, as you do, pragmatically speaking, with a Leica rangefinder. Which is why Leica made goggle lenses and accessory finders for their rangefinders. Like this Vio finder, for example. Just like the one used by Eisensat with his pre-M Leica 3A when he shot the Kiss in 1945. Like many other vintage SLRs from the 60s and 70s, these two cannons offer the further advantage of built-in light meters, although the battery for the FTQL is harder to find than the one for the F1. And you can buy an auxiliary cold shoe mounted meter or pick up an M5, M6, or M7, all with built-in meters, though an M7 will set you back somewhere between three and five grand. The F1, unlike our meterless M3 here, will also show you at what shutter speed you're shooting in the viewfinder. The point is, these mid-century 35mm SLRs generally mean a whole lot less futzing and a whole lot more precision framing and focusing going on. Of course, you can get these same things from a Nikon F or Nikomat based system too, and there is much to be said for SLRs from other manufacturers of the era like Pentax, Minolta, Bessler Topcon, Contax, Mamaya, Miranda, Exacta. You get the idea. Except for Nikon, however, none of them have nearly the breadth of lens options and accessories the Canons do, nor the same parts and repair ecosystem to support them. Nor do any of them offer, for me personally, the connection I have with Canons. The FTQL was the very first real camera I ever bought new. The F1, the very last 35mm manual focus camera I ever bought new. Though believe me, there was a pile of Canon cameras in between as well as afterwards. Of course, if you relax your requirements for the mechanical feel of the era, if autofocus is important to you, even with film, you might be delighted by the more modern late 1990s era capabilities of the last 35 millimeter film camera of any kind I ever bought new, a Canon EOS 3, like this guy. Biomorphic design that lives on in Canon bodies to this day. EF lens mount allowing you to take advantage of Canon's ginormous modern legacy lens catalog slowly being replaced by the purpose-built mirrorless RF mount. Built-in motor drive, illuminated top plate LCD panel, electronic aperture, shutter speed, and meter readouts inside the viewfinder, aperture program or depth of field mode, three-button combination layout on the top deck to the left of the prism that will be familiar to any current 1DX shooter, and I kid you not, I controlled autofocus. The inspiration for today's Canon EOS R3 for about $400, body only. But Hugh, you may argue, none of these cameras has the talismanic quality of an M. Yeah, you know I agree with you. None of them has as quiet a shutter either, because mirror. The M is so quiet and subtle by comparison to SLRs that a number of jurisdictions in the United States actually barred the cameras from the courtroom. Unless they could meet the decibel threshold set by the M. None of them does what a rangefinder does best, allow you to see beyond the frame and to gather almost as much light as the human eye does, although you'll have to decide how important that seeing beyond the frame thing is for yourself. Personally, I never found this to be an issue because once my camera was up to my eye, I could and did move the camera around very quickly with the tiniest wrist movement and make up the difference. And right. No other system camera from that era offers quite the jewel-like mechanical or optical qualities of M primes either, not even like his own R. Tell me. Which of these two images of a giant statue of Leon Trotsky on a rooftop down on the Lower East Side of Manhattan is better? Which one do you like better? The one on the left or the one on the right? 
no pun intended, which image was taken with my own personal Summicron M50 mounted on a Leica MA lent to me by Leica, thanks guys, which one was taken with my own Canon F1 with FD 50mm F1.4? Though, really, what's more interesting to you? Which image is which? Or the fact that there's a giant statue of Leon Trotsky on a rooftop down on the Lower East Side of Manhattan? Now, that's a story. In any case, two different looks to be sure. And yes, of course, I manipulated them in post to create the image I saw in my mind's eye, although they are indicative of which system is which, if you know what to look for, because I worked with what I got out of them. The image on the right was taken with the cannon. That's it for now. A big shout out to KEH for sponsoring this video, a great resource for finding just this kind of gear. Check them out by clicking on the links in the description below and get 5% off when you buy using the discount code HUSHOP, a 5% bonus when you sell using the discount code HUBONUS. I have got to get them to change that discount code. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below because this is an incredible audience. If you'd like a copy of our Streets of New York, the book, head over to www.3bmep.com slash books. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one video session with me for a portfolio review, explore or hone your artistic voice, select gear and more, sign up at www.3bmep.com slash booking. Finally, consider supporting our work by using our no-cost-to-you affiliate links down below. Picking up some official three blind men and an elephant swag at 3bmep.threadless.com. Sending coffee money via PayPal or best of all, join us as a patron over at Patreon. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for it.